My guest today is Carl Cannon, the Washington Bureau Chief of Real Clear Politics, which is one of the most widely read political news websites in the nation. He was formerly the D.C. Bureau Chief for Reader's Digest and the White House correspondent for both the Baltimore Sun and the National Journal. He was a 2007 fellow in residence at Harvard University Institute of Politics, a past president of the White House Correspondents Association, and is a published author. Carl, uh, we're going to have an interesting discussion today. Uh, you and your dad, Lou, were one of the few father-sons that covered the White House. That's right. He covered Reagan. He was he actually started covering Nixon. People don't realize that. And then he was really the most preeminent White House reporter during the Reagan years. That was a great time to be. Well, I'll say. <laughs> and then well, and then I covered Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. But when I kid my dad about this, you know, every hundred years in this country, we're attacked on our own soil. About every hundred years, the president gets impeached. About once a century, we get attacked on our own soil. All three of those things happen. Oh, and, and every hundred years, the winner of the election actually loses, doesn't get to be president. All those things happened in a five-year period when I was covering the White House. It was an exciting time. Well, it had to be, yeah, yeah. to have all that happen. Yeah. You were there in 9-11. That's right. That's right. That, uh, did we know then what we know now, or did we suspect then what we know now, uh, how serious uh, this uh, terrorist threat is? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because everybody has a different reaction. And You know the phrase fog of war. Even people who are clear-minded have part of the fog of war. I, I'll give you an example. I was sitting just a block from here. I was covering the White House for National Journal then, and I was in early, and I saw that first plane hit the tower. And I thought, and the newspapers say it's a Cessna. Well, you know, you could see it wasn't a Cessna. And I you know, thought, that was my first thought yeah. when that, that a small airplane. Yeah, right. and that's yeah. what they said, but you could see on the TV it wasn't, and I thought, and then second plane crashed, and I ran downstairs, I ran into my editor, I said, we're going to have to remake the whole magazine. He said, what's going on? I said, just go upstairs, and I ran to the White House. So part of me knew what was going on right away. This is war. But the other part, running to the White House, that was the least safe place you could possibly go. You didn't know they were still coming after the White House. Yeah, and the Secret Service pushed us out, and you know, it was just chaos in the city here. And in New York was even worse. Then the bomb, the, the Pentagon was attacked, and you had black smoke billowing over the city. And, you know, not, so people knew different parts of it. It was hard to put it all together right away. George W. Bush got it by the end of the day, but even George W. Bush, remember that? He's in Florida oh, speaking about... To kids. Yeah, but, well, he was campaigning for No Child Left Behind, and he's reading a short story. And Michael Moore made fun of him um, for not, you know, telling everybody what happened, but... I think that's a little unfair. He didn't want to alarm the children, we found out later. But he didn't quite get it because he flew, you know, he didn't go come back to Washington right away. Remember the Secret Service told him, go to Louisiana, go to Nebraska. Right. By the end of the day, he was a little shaky. He gave a speech. You know, those folks who attacked us, well, folks wasn't the right word. But by the next morning, George W. Bush had become a wartime president. It was a great transformation. It happened overnight. But, you know, at, at that time, we, we now know uh, it... This war that we're in will not be fought in, uh, you know, the routine way of armies, navies engaging in the Pacific or Atlantic or, you know, in, in uh, Europe or whatever. I mean, this is a, a bunch of rubes that, you know, they, they have a different, uh, a different plan, totally different plan. Well, I think that's right. You know... At the response to 9-11, George W. Bush led this invasion of Iraq, and this, that was sort of the, I think maybe that we'll remember that as the last set piece. You know, it was like a World War II mobilization, huge tank battalions and, you know, whole entire divisions of Marines over there taking over a country. But that's not really, that didn't really make us safer. And in the end... It didn't make it safer. It didn't work. Yes. And we it have, actually and, didn't work. And you have this asymmetrical war. Eric Holder, who was Attorney General... Um, he was in the Justice Department, Bill Clinton, and then later Attorney General of Barack Obama. He gave an interview to David Bondrelli, the great magazine writer for Time, and he said, 
you know, this is going to be a long war. And, and that's really how to think of it, the long war. And he said, you know, I just hope, I, I think we'll win it, but I hope we win it the right way. And so it turns out that all of these decisions. Eric Holder said that. Eric Holder back in 2000 uh, on 9-11, and so right in the days after that. And I think, you know, this idea of how much privacy do we sacrifice, how much, you know, what, how far do we go, and how do we think about immigration, all of these, these are tough questions that, you know, it's not just getting a, the biggest army and going killing the Did bad guys. Did you think of those questions then at we, that point? In National Journal, we wrote a number of things about, a number of cover stories about that. And one of the things we were talked about was civilian deaths, collateral damage. You know, the terrorists, they don't mind killing innocent people. They like it. That's not what we want to do. And so it really is a different, the long war is a good way to think of it. And I think we'll be going through making these moral and ethical judgments all the way along the line for, and, you know, all my life, I think. Well, it's a, it's a changing world, no kidding. And, uh, Tell them about the news business, how it's changed. The, but now, let's go over to politics. Okay. That, too, is a change. Don't, not so much the technology side of the political issue, but what, uh, how different is this one than, see, I'm so much older than you, so I've seen a lot more than you've seen. <laughs> but you are a historian, so you've read back and probably know more than I do. But I've been around a long time. Well, but well, this th is weird. Yeah, isn't it? Well, th think, let's start with one. Let's take a couple of things. The first thing is this anger in the electorate. It's palpable. And I think that's new. It, you know, people say that Donald Trump's the angry candidate. Trump said, I'll wear that mantle. He said that at a debate. Yeah. I'm, I'll wear the angry mantle. But he's not the only one. Ted, Ted Cruz had come here from Texas. He'd spent about two years setting himself to run in this angry lane. And I don't know if you've been to a Bernie Sanders rally, but he's not a happy warrior. <laughs> oh, he's not. <laughs> and, and these are people, and they appeal to different segments, but the American people, they're, they're angry at their institutions. They don't trust Wall Street. They don't trust the government. They don't tr a lot of them don't trust the police. And, and this you know, wages have been stagnant for so long. You've got this angry electorate out there, and it is roiling everything. Another thing I'd say is that qualifications don't seem, the public is so tired of politics as usual that they don't care if you have the qualifications to be well, president. Wait a minute, and that's a new thing. Minute. What's qualifications? I'm, I'm not sure I understand that. All right. That's, that's what the voters are asking. So remember when Barack Obama ran? He did not have what we had come to think of as the qualifications to be president, the, the requisite experience. He's a community uh, well, yeah. organizer. He'd never been a governor. No. He'd never been an executive. He'd never been a general. All of the presidents we had, you know, longtime senators, uh, war heroes, generals. I mean, John F. Kennedy, who they compared Obama to, you know, three terms in the House, two terms in the Senate, not one, naval officer, war hero, written books about, you know, World War II, I mean, he, this guy had, and he was considered to have a thin resume, but Barack Obama just threw the playbook out the window. Absolutely he did. And had, he had not one thing that he could point to of accomplishment. Right, and when he was asked about this early in the campaign, it was a funny exchange. He said, he had a kind of a glib line. He said, well, look at Cheney and Rumsfeld. They have plenty of experience. They made a mess of things. And it was a friendly audience, Democrats, fundraiser, they laughed. Later, David Remnick of The New Yorker asked him in a very friendly interview, said, well, that, that was a really good answer. But Barack Obama's smart. He realized it was not a good answer. It painted himself into the corner. I mean, what job would we say not having experience is a benefit? Uh, airline pilot? Brain surgeon? Heart surgeon? Uh, no, just president? That's the only job? So Obama said, no, no, it was a dumb answer. Here's my answer. And then he went into this thing that you he mentioned. He did say dumb answer. Well, he said it wasn't a good answer. I, but he said, and then he started talking about, well, I've had other kinds of experience, community organizer, state legislature. So even Barack Obama realized that that's not a sustainable thing. That's 2007. Now, just less than 10 years later, eight years later in the election cycles, Ted Cruz, less experienced than Barack Obama in the Senate. Donald Trump, no experience of any kind. Ben Carson, what's he doing running for president? You know, all these... Well, but he did have... Ben Carson? Sure, but these he, are... He had done something. He'd done, he'd done great things. Yeah. But again, I, at that first debate, the Republicans at the Ronald Reagan Library, I was looking at Carson, and I was thinking, what a great heart surgeon this guy was. But then I'm looking at Air Force One, I said, all right, he's a great heart surgeon. They wouldn't let him fly that plane. So how could he be president? 
And I well, think, wait I think second. Barack wait Obama second. changed the How I many of them could fly Air Force One? It's a metaphor. What I'm saying <laughs> is, he, you know, if you remember two, all right, remember two tall Jones? Yeah. Football sure, player? Sure. Right. Played for Dallas Cowboys. Yes, he did. Great. Six, six, nine, two forty five. Looked like Adonis. Remember he quit for a while? He was going to be heavyweight champion of the world. Right. Well, he fought some palookas that CBS hooked him up with that you never heard of and beat him. And, you know, and after about two years, he realized boxing is a profession, man. I'm going back to football. That's how I think about politics. We are so mad at our politicians. We don't want to think of it as a profession. But why isn't it a profession? There are things to learn. And you've realized some of the stuff Donald Trump has said along the way, sort of casually saying, well, let's give new South Korea should have nuclear weapons. An experienced person wouldn't say these kinds of things. So I, I guess I'm the, I guess I'm just old enough. I think that you know having experience is still an important thing. It is important, but you know maybe not everything. If you look at Reagan, uh, governor, of California, two-term governor of the largest state. If, it, if California was an economy, the sixth yeah, largest but, economy yeah, in the world. But look ahead of that, mm. not much. No, Screen, um, President but, of the Act. But he deal. rose to the occasion. Sure he did. He learned on the job real fast. And he did. And others will, too, from time to time. And But, you know, you've developed a, a very, very uh, good, maybe that's short, but special uh, business right quick. I mean, you're, uh, you're your company. Well, real clear politics. You know, I don't take the credit for this. It was these two guys, John McIntyre and Tom Bevan. They, they were at Princeton, although they didn't know each other. John played lacrosse and Tom played football. But they met after school, after college. And in 2000, they thought there should be a website where you can go and get the best of politics, left, right, center. It's all right there. And you know, the news, these guys knew nothing about the news business at the exact time in history when that was the right thing to know, nothing. Because our business model was broken. And I would argue our journalism model was broken, too, and we didn't know it. I mean, the, the left, the liberal left bias, this is not a figment of conservatives' imagination. This was, this was a pretty pronounced thing in the big city dailies and in the news magazines and the networks. But let me interrupt you. Sure. I came up newspaper, not journalist, paper boy. You and I are old newspaper boys. Paper boy. Or what paper did you deliver? Holdenville Daily News. Holdenville. Yeah, one paper a day, but the uh, but how much did it cost? Pennies. It was twenty five cents. Yeah. Well, no, I made a penny a paper. Penny a paper. Net. Yeah. Net. Yeah. I had twenty eight papers, and but I I collected better than any other uh, carrier. So a route forty six papers came up next to me, and I said, "Let me have it." They said, "You can have it, but you have to give up the twenty eight. No, I collect better than anybody else. I got it. I ended up on that paper. By the time I was 14 years old, I had 154 papers. Wow. I had the biggest <laughs> route in in the town. Did you live on your bike? Yep, yeah. on the bike. I could throw left, right. And and so I did it from the middle of the circle back and forth in the street. Damn near got hit a few times by cars. <laughs> but I could throw but I miss more porches <laughs> than anybody so I had my kick bill was 10 cents a paper oh boy. and and I had <laughs> but, but anyway I got real interested in news and went back to the teletype red HMS hood sunk by Bismarck North Sea and then I looked at Singapore Prince uh, uh, the Ark Royal and the Prince of Wales sunk by the Japanese. I was intent on that stuff. I mean, I, how has it changed now? I well, mean, I'll tell you how it's changed, but let me first tell you a little story about, because I was the same as you. I got interested, and I can tell you the exact day. It was June 5th and 6th in 1968, and I delivered the San Francisco Chronicle in Sacramento. So it's out of town paper. So my right was spread out geographically. I had 90 papers delivered on my bike. And that morning, remember in the old days, the TV would go off at one in the morning and make that horrible sound. It was just blank television before cable. TV, I was before TV. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so anyway, I know what. My mother wakes me up at four thirty in the morning. I said, "Mom, I really don't have to get up till five thirty. She says, "No, you have to get up now because Bobby Kennedy was shot last night after you went to bed. I said, "He just won the California primary." I said, "Oh my gosh!" And she says, "Yeah." 
and but it's not in the papers yet because it was after deadline. It's not in your papers. Okay, hold up. Yes, sir. That same point in time for me was December 7, 1941. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's right. And you realize on those days the power of the news. What happened was, and my mom wrote out for me the latest that he would, it was pretty clear Robert Kennedy was going to die. He hadn't been declared dead yet. But she wrote it on a little three by five card. I said, Mom, nobody's going to be up. She says, There will be people up. And I went on this route. Boone, it took me two hours that day to do my route because at like every third house, a person was up, usually a woman of the house, wearing a night coat, you know, sort of against the morning chill, a little bathrobe, and said, what happened? And I read, and by about the fourth house, I'd memorize it. People would cry, and they'd hug you. And I thought, and, you know, a man's shot, you know what that means, you're 14 years old. But I, the power of the news, it never left me, I realized that day. Well, I did, I did those, you know, extra, extra. You sold the, yeah, the extras. Yeah, 25 cents, what we got for them. Japanese bomb, Pearl Harbor. Amazing, huh? It is amazing. But now, all right. So I'm quit dwelling in the past. You want me to get to the future, the present? I love the past. <laughs> well, so these guys, Tom Bevan and John McIntyre, started this website. It's all online, Real Clear Politics. And the idea is you'll go there for the best arguments, left, right, and center. Which you know you can watch cable TV for hours and not get a differing viewpoint. I'm not going to name names, but you know the stations I mean, the networks I mean. And but on this one, we give people the average polls. And uh, I'm in charge of our... Yeah, your polls are considered to be the best. Well, we don't do the polls, we average the polls. I know, you, you bring you, them together and, and analyze them. And you know what's interesting? These guys came up with this idea. A lot of people do it, but they were the first. And it turns out that that's really how you get the best information. Because a poll can deviate here or there, but you put them all together, like most things, you get a pretty good snapshot. Well, the, uh, I, I looked at yours today, and it was, it was on energy. Oh, we have we have these other verticals. Real Clear Energy is one of them. Yeah, yeah and that that there were ten uh, topics yeah. there, and I w I would have I would have called up five of them to read. Yeah, well that's I right. Mean, yeah, it, they were great titles. I don't know what what was behind them. I'm suspecting good stuff. Well, we aggregate. So so those sites, the verticals, we have Real Clear Science, Real Clear Sports, Real Clear History. But Real Clear Energy, which is one of the vibrant ones, it just explores everything that's going on, oil and gas, uh, renewables, um, conservation, coal, what's going on in nuclear, what's going on in Washington that affects these. What's going on in nuclear energy? Yeah, well, Very little. not much here. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are any place. I think. I think well, China's building coal and nuclear. They're, they're sort of, you know, we, our politicians like to say, I'm a all of the above guy. Well, the Chinese yeah. really are all of the above guys. They want it all. Well, they're, they're desperate for energy, right. no question. Right. But did, today, you know, you're producing 93 million barrels of oil a day in the world. That's the world production. And the uh, uh, United States uses 20 million barrels. Next to the United States, you know who it is? I don't. China. China. Well, see, that, think how but, fast they're growing. Okay, yeah. we're using 20 million barrels a day, and China uses 10. Can you imagine that? Yeah, but they... But they, they're coming up fast. That's right. They'll, but, they'll, they'll, they'll catch us. They will. Yeah. But India is coming up very, very fast, right. too. Well, that's why when uh, the Democrats got on to this idea of global... you got to stop the burning of fossil fuels for global warming. But we won't count India and China. They don't have to participate. That's when sort of they lost half the well, Congress. Yeah. How, can you, how can you say they don't have to participate? Well, out of the 93 million barrels that you produce, 70% of the 93 goes to transportation fuel. Right. Right. Okay, right. now, we're that's, not gonna use fossil fuels? Well, that's hard, to, that's hard to figure out how you get rid of that. Okay, second to that, they'll say, well, we'll, we'll use renewables. Right. Wait a minute. Renewals, they don't do anything for heavy-duty trucks. Did you ever see Back to the Future? Remember they had the flux capacitor? They have that little thing in the car, a, a little nuclear reactor, and they pour coffee grinds and banana peels in it, and away they go? <laughs> that's the well, future, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the future. My ass. <laughs> that is not the future. I can tell you, you're going to be using fossil fuels for 50 years anyway. Yeah. Well, and, and but the only two fuels that move a heavy-duty truck are diesel and natural gas. And you have guys say, "Well, battery." No, battery won't move an 18-wheeler. 
So there are a lot of things to work out. One thing is this country should have an energy plan. We're the only country in the world without an energy plan. Yeah, why do you think that is? Well, it's, it, I don't know how, how much time we've got, but I'm- <laughs> It's I'm your the, show, how much time you want to take as much as you want. I think it's because the Republicans and Democrats have made everything partisan, including energy policy. But maybe you have a better, you know more about it than I do. Well, I think this, the, the, the energy plan, it, it's different. We're the only country, do you know what, uh, what freehold minerals are? No, sir. Okay, we're the only country in the world that has freehold minerals. You're going to learn something here. Yeah, all right. Okay. I'm, I'm free still a reporter. I like okay. learning. It's real easy to do it on this tabletop. <laughs> if you were in Germany, uh, Canada, Australia, China, wherever, and you buy a farm, that's what you get right there, what you can see, the surface. Mm. The United States, you buy the farm. All the way to the core of the earth. That's right. That's freehold minerals. Then I can demonstrate what that's caused. There have been about five million wells drilled in the world today, and over half of them have been drilled in the United States. Yeah, a lot of them. The freehold mineral the the, that yeah. has caused it. Yeah, that's caused that to happen, and so it's uh, it's easy to have an energy plan when you own all the minerals when you own everything below the surface down. You can have an energy plan pretty quick. Harder in the United States to have an energy plan when the, when the federal government owns only a really small portion of the minerals. Do you remember when I, I mean, when I was in school, I'm, you were out making your first fortune, but they told us their energy, there's gonna be no more energy by, you know, 1975 or whatever. No, 85. Anyway, no more oil. It'll yeah. be gone, all gone. It, that's when you peaked, yeah. was 85, right. and then you'd start oil. to decline. Yeah, so. But that changed, you know why? Yeah, the, yeah because they learned how to drill sideways. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Because you, free oil minerals had influence on all that. Yeah. Well, it's been an uh, interesting interview with you. Good to get to know you, and a successful guy that you are in, uh, in, in your business. Well, for me, it was a pleasure and an honor. Good, thanks. Thank